I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the case Universal Camera Corp versus NLRB, a quaint old case from the US Supreme Court from back in 1951. And this is about the substantial evidence test under the APA. Now, for my students, I have to say, some uh, semesters I've actually told them to skip this case or not uh, assigned it uh, for reading because it's a, a really old case. And even though it remains good law, um, it's such settled law now that we don't really depend on, on this case. Uh, instead, we're more likely to look at the Administrative Procedure Act's provisions and um, recent cases applying those. Nevertheless, um, the case is pretty famous. It's in a lot of administrative law case books. It's still cited. So let's take a look at what happens in Universal Camera Corp. So an employee at this company complained that he was fired in retaliation for testifying against his employer at an NLRB representation proceeding. The, that's the National Labor Relations Board. And basically they handle disputes between unions and the management at corporations. And, um, and sometimes they have to sort things out like whether the union is actually legit or really represents the employees there and so forth. And and this employee had testified basically in favor of the union um, or the workers and against the management. And his main evidence for saying that this was a retaliatory firing was the timing of his discharge, which was months after his testimony. Um, and also that his supervisor had made hostile statements to him uh, in the meantime because of his unfavorable testimony. In other words, he knew that the, his bosses were mad at him. Um, the employer had a different story, right? So the managers at Universal Camera Corp, uh, their account in contrast plausibly depicted the employee as just a troublemaker. He was insubordinate at the job site and that's why they fired him. And so um, now notice that if it, this matters legally, the, the, the points they're arguing matter from a legal standpoint under the National Labor Relations Act, you empl employers can't fire a worker um, for uh, being involved in the union or testifying at a hearing that we can't have. So if it was a retaliatory discharge or termination, he would get his job back. On the other hand, if he was just a bad worker or was insubordinate or something like that, then they are allowed to fire him. So the employee countered that his the alleged insubordination had occurred a full month before his firing. And so that therefore it couldn't have been the what prompted it. And he also said that there was a conspiracy among several management figures to set him up uh, to be fired, to create a situation where um, it, there would be an incident and he could get fired. Well, the hearing officer for the National Labor Relations Board listened to these, the two sides of the story and thought that the employer was more credible and his account was more plausible. But, the, but here's the problem, and this is something to understand about how some of these agencies and agency adjudications work. You have a hearing officer that basically did a, some sort of formal or informal hearing um, uh, to, about this and took testimony and made a credibility determination and issued a proposed decision. And then it gets to the board for review. And I, I gotta tell you, most of the time, these agencies, these boards and commissions, just sign off on what their administrative law judges and hearing officers decide, right? But sometimes they um, haven't either have a contrary agenda, right? So maybe the board or commission because they're presidential appointees, maybe they've become politicized or maybe they have their eye on a particular hearing officer or administrative law judge for being a softy or something like that. So occasionally this happens and the um, and the so the NLRB actually reversed the its own hearing officer and didn't really give a specific reason for ignoring the hearing officer's credibility finding. They basically just said that 
they reached the opposite conclusion. And the Supreme Court reversed the National Labor Relations Board in turn and basically reinstated what the hearing officer had found, um, though it did adopt in the, in the process the APA's substantial evidence test for these types of cases. And that's really the reason that Universal Camera Corp is, st is famous and still sort of matters today. Otherwise, to me, this the facts of the case, this is a really run of the mill um, a, a wrongful discharge claim. Um, but the fact that this is where the US Supreme Court officially like embraced the ABA's standards of the APA's standards of review is why this case took on lasting significance. So the two big takeaways from the case are that the APA's substantial evidence test applies even if the agency's enabling statute created the hearing regime that's under review. And this may seem obvious, and that's part of why I don't always assign this case. Um, but remember the year of this case, right? The court is hearing this like in 1950, it goes to the Supreme Court and the APA was a pretty new law at the time. And we didn't have a lot of uh, case law interpreting it yet. And it wasn't clear what it's, it, how it was going to interact um, with other statutes, right? With the agency's enabling statutes. And so Universal Camera Corp was one of our early cases about the Administrative Procedure Act and how it applies even when we have an enabling statute that spells out a lot of the procedures that the agency in question is already following. Um, the second takeaway is that the substantial evidence test is deferential, but not absolute deference. And so now if you're wondering about this, you should flip to the back of your case book to that appendix um, where it has the Administrative Procedure Act in the 700s and find the standards of review section and read what it says about substantial evidence, which is basically this applies to formal adjudication and formal here, rulemaking where we have a trial-like proceeding and an official record, like the testimony is recorded by court reporters and exhibits are, uh, evidence is taken in as itemized and um, tagged exhibits and authenticated and so forth, very different from, let's say, an informal hearing. And so, and basically the idea is that the things have to be based on the substantial evidence test. Now in, in modern times, this isn't that hard for the agency to win because they get a lot of deference. And um, the, the kind of famous saying about this is it means more than a scintilla or more than a smidgen of evidence will be enough to count as set substantial evidence. In other words, I wanna make very clear for my students, substantial evidence does not mean preponderance of evidence in administrative law. If you don't get anything else, uh, let me clear that up or disabuse you of that. Substantial evidence is not preponderance evidence. It's a lower quantum of evidence. So it means that there is substantial evidence in the record supporting it, not that it's more than 50% or more than 51%. It's certainly not um, clear and convincing evidence or something like that. So substantial evidence is something less than preponderance of evidence, but more than nothing and more than um, the famous line is a scintilla. Okay. Even though the majority decided that the board here deserved deference for its decisions, it was actually troubled by the dismissiveness that the board had taken toward the hearing officer's findings about the credibility of the testimony. Remember, the hearing officer talked to these people, heard them talk, and found the employer just more believable than this employee who had this big elaborate conspiracy theory about how everyone was out to get him. And the board didn't have those two people. It's reading the transcripts from the hearings and then reaching the opposite conclusion based just on reading the transcripts. And so the hearings officer's findings were part of the evidence in the record. And basically the Supreme Court here in Justice Frankfurter's sort of stilted language says to, in effect, that the other evidence doesn't outweigh that. By the way, I have pictures of the cameras. This was a really big camera company at the time in the 1950s. Um, 
So universal camera appeared to, let me make sure I didn't skip a slide, sorry. Um, universal camera appeared to signal a change in the direction for the court. So first, whatever aspects of the record supported the agency's fact-finding were henceforth to be evaluated in the context of the record as a whole. And judicial attention focused also on anything in the record that cast doubt on the agency's conclusion. In other words, the court was going to weigh it. And it wasn't, they weren't going to, again, it's not preponderance. They're not saying that the evidence on supporting the agency has to always be more. But here we had evidence that they thought was pretty troubling, and there just wasn't enough to um, be so dismissive, on the other side, to be so dismissive of it. Also, further, and I, we're almost at the end, I promise, reviewing courts were supposed to assess the weight of the contrary evidence in determining whether evidence supporting the agency amounted to substantial. In other words, universal cameras sort of set the stage for the substantial evidence test still being a lot of work for the courts or giving the courts a lot of latitude to um, go through the record and see what the agency, the, which is almost always going to be a board or a commission, to be honest, but not always, um, and uh, what they concluded, and then um, decide what about the contrary evidence? Is it really powerful evidence, or was it just every, every record has a little bit of evidence that points in different directions? The case, though, as I said, is at the time was really significant because it settled the legal question of when, when the APA's standards of review apply, which is basically almost always. Okay, that concludes our lecture about Universal Camera Corp um, versus the National Labor Relations Board.